All right, well, while I am here in the car, which is the warmest place that I can find anywhere around, thanks to the heated seat and the steering wheel and the actual heat, um, I did want to talk a little bit about the price war that is starting in the world of electric vehicles. So stick with me and we'll get into it. All right, it is quite cold. It is 21 degrees today. It was five this morning when we drove to hockey. What? And we actually had the little snowflake icon here on the batter. Oh, there it just came back. Uh, but it had gone away. I figured maybe it was because the car was uh, conditioning itself so much. And I see that we lost about five miles of range while the car was just sitting there. So I figured maybe the heater was actually running to keep the batteries warm uh, just because of how cold it is. But you can see as a result of that just how much of an impact that makes on our range. So we're seeing much less there and much higher consumption than normal. So you can see here trip A, which is over the lifetime of the car, we've been averaging 277 watt hours per mile. But for today, and on this trip, we're at 363 and 338 respectively. So just a huge difference and much, much worse when it's cold. So you can just see what an effect the cold has on the batteries of an electric car. But all that said, it's really not that horrible. Yeah, we've got snowflakes back on again now. Especially in the newer Teslas, this is a 2022 Model Y long range. They have a heat pump which actually runs to uh, very quickly and efficiently heat up the batteries to keep them warm so it doesn't stay long uh, cold very long but when you'll see the impact the most is when the car is just sitting outside in the cold uh, with nothing running so since this car is in the garage normally uh, we didn't actually get the snowflake at all while we uh, were driving where we were just going um, but while we were there, it was just sitting outside, and so it effectively cold soaked down. Now this can also have a pretty major impact on charging, because when the batteries are cold, it's much harder to get energy into them. And so that's why the car will actually normally precondition uh, to heat up the batteries if it knows that you're going to a supercharger or uh, other charger. A lot of other EVs don't really have that. Uh, Hyundai's have been adding it recently, uh, but uh, many still don't. And you'll find that when the battery is cold like that, it just, you get much, much lower kilowatt rates of recharge when you uh, go and plug in the car until effectively the car can put so much energy into the batteries that the heat loss from that warms them up and they can accept more charge. So another way to also warm it up is to just uh, drive the car aggressively because if you um, use the motors a lot and then especially using regenerative braking which puts energy back into the batteries, that'll also uh, start to warm them up and um, you'll arrive at a charger with a little bit more heat and be able to take a little more energy in. So we'll see when we get home. Um, on a home charger in the garage, I really don't expect we're gonna see much of a difference in terms of charging rate, but we can see if that appears to be any slower than normal. So just some things to look out for when you get into the winter and deep freeze like we've got finally in the Northeast now. Still no snow, but getting colder winter temperatures now. So one other thing I just noticed is that I just lost access to the MyQ garage opener and closer functionality. So I guess the trial that I had for it, uh, which was a 30 day trial that I started when the feature first became available here, must have just run out. And so it's actually not even showing up anymore in here. And you know, I thought it was a nice feature. Like it, it's nice that it actually knows if your door is open or close or not. And so, you know, it'll only recommend that you open it or close it if it is in the opposite state. Um, and you can even have it automatically and open and close it based off of location. But, um, you know, it's, it's nice, but I just don't see a value in 
enough value in it to pay, um, I think it's $45 for the year or something like that, uh, to have that when I have a perfectly adequate garage door opener uh, here already. And then one other thing is I had a lot of people asking about the ski racks that I have and the roof racks that I got off of Amazon. So if you're interested in those, I do have information in another video on those, but they've been doing great. We've had them on all winter. Uh, they do make a bit of noise. The roof racks themselves, not so much, but the uh, ski racks when they're on there, definitely do. And I've just found that uh, when they're empty, especially if you are on uh, the highway, um, they're certainly pretty noisy, but um, with skis in them, really not so bad. Around town, don't even notice them. And when the ski rack part itself isn't on there, just the roof rack, uh, I don't really hear anything unless the wind is like blowing directly at the car, in which case you definitely do hear it. Um, but it's hardly noticeable and certainly not a reason to not get them. And the install was super easy, so I definitely still recommend it. All right, so we are almost empty on the battery right now, so we're gonna get the car charging, and let's see how much a cold battery affects at home level two charging. So we are going at, what does that say? Uh, okay, we're ramping up, we're only at, oof, there we go. Taking some time to power up. Okay, so it's, we are at 32 amps and 237 volts, so that's about what we would normally get here. So that's at about seven kilowatts. So that's typical. So I guess at uh, that limited power, this really doesn't make a difference. So it's only when you are uh, supercharging or otherwise DC fast charging that a cold battery really would make much of a difference at all. By the time we really get too much juice in here anyway, the battery uh, will be warmed up by the heater since it's gonna run while it's charging anyway. All right, so no big deal for that. So no worries about driving the car around when it's uh, absolutely freezing outside. All right, well, as I am sure many people have seen, Tesla has essentially kicked off a price war in the electric vehicle industry right now. Uh, as of right now, it's really only Tesla and Ford that have started lowering prices, but I think this is just the beginning of a bunch of other things that will come, and it just shows the power that Tesla has right now uh, to be able to take prices down and still make pretty good margins, uh, all to set themselves up even more powerfully as a uh, top competitor in the EV space. So for anyone who missed it, Tesla dropped uh, the prices of almost their entire range of cars pretty significantly at the beginning of January. So cars like the Model Y, uh, which is like this one, uh, went down from $65,995 base, uh, which is about what this one was, or no, I paid actually less, but uh, this one I think would have been just about 67 uh, because of the uh, color, and I forget what other options I have. Um, uh, so it went from about 66000 down to 53000 so five. $52,999, which is a 20% price drop. The Model 3 uh, performance went from $53,990, or went down to that from $62,990. And that means that you can actually lease a standard range Model 3 now for $399 a month, or you know just under $400 a month, which is pretty crazy and very, very competitive. And so as a result of that, um, or maybe not directly a result, but I think it's pretty clear that it was, uh, it's definitely too much of a coincidence to uh, be a coincidence. Um, Ford dropped the price of the Mach-E uh, down 6% on average across the range. And the midpoint of that is $4,500 uh, for, I guess, the most popular versions. So for example, a premium all-wheel drive goes from $57,675 down to $53,995. Uh, 
And the extended range per, uh, premium all-wheel drive goes from $66,275 to $60,995. So that's still $7,000 more than a Model Y, which I don't think is super competitive, but uh, it's still a pretty significant decrease. So a little bit over 5000 for that. Uh, and then to uh, compare, the Model X actually decreased in price now to $109,990, which actually makes it much more competitive with uh, the SUV that we've got ordered, which is the Rivian R1S, which is at $92,500 uh, in the configuration that we've got, which is the uh, quad motor uh, long range battery pack. So basically the reason that I think this happened uh, is kind of twofold. One was because of the way that it looked like the EV credit tax credits from the infrastructure bill were going to shake out, it looked like the Model Y was not going to qualify for the $7,500 federal tax incentive, whereas some of the competitors would have uh, because it was not being categorized as an SUV for some reason and instead as a sedan, it would have only been eligible for a price up to $55,000, which it uh, was over in every single variation. So by dropping the price, they actually brought almost all of them down uh, below that now. Actually, I think all of them. Uh, even the long range would have been um, uh, eligible for the federal tax credit. So I think that's part of it. But then uh, in the meantime, they actually rewrote the tax incentive rules and now it just matches EPA so this actually does qualify as an SUV and interestingly the Mach-E was in the exact same situation so initially for some reason it did not count as an SUV but now with the rewrite it does again so both of those are eligible because they're both far under $80,000 now but I actually don't think that was the main reason I think the bigger reason was Tesla um, has such a powerful position in the market right now and such a first mover advantage that I think that part of this was to execute that power and um, undercut a bunch of other competitors so that they can stay the leader, still make money off of it and get more and more and more Teslas out on the road. They have such good retention rates that not only are they you know, introducing a tremendous number of new people to EVs, but all of those people, or almost all of them, are then sticking with Tesla. And so they're really building a tremendous brand loyalty and essentially just um, getting ahead of losing people to competitors who will now be in Teslas and likely stay with them much longer. So I think it's a smart move uh, in that regard. They're not losing that much per vehicle now. And um, especially with some of the improvements being made in the factory and the tooling, as well as the new uh, Project Highland architecture that is heavily rumored and now like being spotted uh, out there, uh, which is aimed to bring cost down. Basically, they're in a really strong position now where they can still make a profit, but they're just going to get so many more cars out and I think just really dramatically outsell so many competitors and really put themselves at a huge advantage for the future. So I think smart moves there. I think Ford is also very smart. They have a little bit of a, I guess maybe not, it's not like a second mover advantage. It's almost a first mover, even though they're the front, not the first mover. Um, in that they, they, you know, un, they weren't there as early as Tesla, but they were still out there pretty early. And so they've got a lot of um, vehicles on the road already. They are able to you know, leverage uh, cost efficiencies by ramping up their production and you know, now being in the third model year of the Mach-E. And so they're still going to make money off of them too, but they similarly can drop prices, be more competitive with um, other cars out there in the market, and I think just uh, end up selling a lot more Mach-E's to people and keeping them in them than they would have otherwise. So it's worth taking that price hit now for uh, all of them to just get ahead of the competitors. And what I think is really surprising uh, is, or maybe not if you know these companies, but uh, really disappointing is that uh, most of the other competitors really haven't followed suit yet. And so... Volkswagen, GM, uh, and Hyundai, all uh, the groups of those, um, which includes their sub-brands, all announced that they would not be reducing prices right now. And I think it just, you know, I mean, it shows that they haven't made the proper investment yet so that they can't uh, leverage efficiencies. And I think it's just going to continue to cost them because they're not going to get uh, cars out there as fast as they should. 
So uh, Volkswagen in particular, uh, I think is really gonna be disadvantaged by this. Uh, the fact that they are not reducing prices on the Taycan to compete with the Model S uh, is gonna hurt them there. The fact that the ID4, you know, it's still uh, more uh, cost uh, uh, effective, cheaper than the competitors from Tesla and Ford, but not that much so anymore. And I just, I think that they're kind of eroding the advantage that they have in pricing there um, to their detriment. And I think it is going to send a lot of people who might have otherwise been looking at ID4s at the Model 3 and Y now, because the price really isn't a huge difference there. And then last, I think, um, you know, for GM and Hyundai, who are, you know, finally starting to get some traction, Hyundai's got, you know, great cars like the Ioniq and the EV6 out, as well as the GV60 and Genesis. Um, they're all doing well, but uh, I think they would be, you know, doing much better if they had a price advantage and um, could even just, you know, show that they are growing those brands and continuing to leverage those platforms. Uh, and then GM, who just you know has really kind of squandered some of the early investments that they made in electrification, uh, is really just playing catch up now and um, so far behind that uh, it really seems like they're just uh, going to struggle and struggle over the next several years to um, get anywhere close to the competitors. And then last but not least, there's the um, other uh, manufacturers who are just so far out of the game now, like Toyota and uh, Nissan, Honda, that um, I just think it's going to be essentially impossible for them to catch up at this point. They're never going to be able to get down to the uh, cost efficiencies that they need to to compete uh, with Tesla and Ford now. And um, I think it's uh, almost going to be game over for them uh, unless they start to do something soon. They've just been super uninspiring and really not doing anything uh, as of yet. So we'll see how all of that goes. Um, I think it'll also be interesting to see you know, some of the other EV startups uh, like uh, Rivian, Lucid, um, even Polestar maybe start making some moves on pricing now. You know, they started a little bit later, but I think it's another place where they might have an advantage because they've been invested in the electric world for longer than some of the more established brands. So as a person who's got a Rivian uh, pre-order in and uh, finally got a updated uh, date that um, says we should be expecting ours in January through June of 2024, uh, I would not mind some price decreases uh, that would come and be retroactive uh, over the next year. All right, well, with that, I hope you uh, found it just as interesting as I did to see how prices are coming down in the EV world. Uh, let me know below what you think. Is this just the start of a much bigger price war? Uh, is this just tex Tesla exercising the power that they've got? Uh, please do sound off below. With that, thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you in the next one.